This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. This is Rosia Shy uh, with another episode. Uh, this episode being episode 132, Redheaded Stepchild, about uh, Bitcoin XT, which is part of our ongoing continuous series about the block size debate. Uh, Bitcoin is a messy bitch. In this episode, we are going to break down the first proposal to raise the block size of Bitcoin. Um, this one came from Mike Hearn, uh, one of the Bitcoin core developers, early developers. And we're going to talk about how this one kind of not only launched other proposals to increase the block size, but the frame and the split and the cracks, if you will, started with this particular proposal. The You can say the certain problems or certain aspects of the community that have always been there kind of bubbled up to the surface uh, with this proposal. But before we get into what Bitcoin XT is and its part it plays in the block size debate, the news. Senators want FBI to find out who attacked net neutrality comment system. This comes from uh, John Boken at um, Ars Technica. Uh, the Democrats say net neutrality proceedings and interrogating threatened by the, the DOS attack. So five Democrat senators, uh, this was published uh, May 31st, asked the Federal Bureau of Investigations to find out who was behind the attack on the Federal Communication Commission's public comment system. The FCC website failed on May 8th, just as many people were trying to submit comments on the commission's plan to gut net, net neutrality rules. Uh, the public comment period associated with the FCC's rulemaking authority is a critical part of the regulatory process and the primary way of the American people to make their voices heard. Senators Brian Schuss of Hawaii, Alan Franklin of Minnesota, Patrick Leahy of Vermont, and Markey of Massachusetts, and Ron Wheaton of Oregon wrote in a letter to the FBI Acting Director Andrew McCabe. They reported the cyber attack on the FCC's electronic comment filing system is extremely troubling given that it threatened to stifle the public ability to weigh on these issues. Uh, we ask that the FBI prioritize this matter and investigate the source of this attack, the senators also wrote. Uh, this particular cat attack may have denied the American people the opportunity to contribute to what is supposed to be a fair and transparent process, which may in turn call into question the integrity of the FCC's rulemaking proceedings. So a lot has happened with this. Um, there's still ongoing discussions about new net neutrality, and there's things that have happened and things that are stalled. Um, this particular issue, there's a lot of different theories. Some say there wasn't a DOS, a DOS attack, but the fact that there were so many uh, spam bots that were trying to make comments on the site, that the site itself just got sluggish and crashed. It wasn't re really well built. Others are pointing out the nature of the comments, how some um, individuals' um, names were utilized in support when they, they in fact, didn't support uh, net neutrality. So there's a lot of issues um, with this aspect of this process, if you will. Uh, we'll talk about it further on um, a word for the metaverse, but uh, it's important that, you know, there's going to be a day of action again um, in July, and we'll talk about that where a number of different websites are going to shut down like they did, I believe it was almost three years or four years ago, they did a similar thing where they shut down their websites and went black and asked people to contact their Congress people to prevent a surveillance bill from um, getting passed. And now they're asking the same thing about net neutrality. Uh, but continuing on with the article here, um, the FCC initially attributed the downtime to multiple distributed denial of service attacks perpetrated by external actors who were trying to take down the website. Further analysis suggests the incident was caused either by an unusual type of DOS attack launched from a cloud service or poorly written spam bots. Some net neutrality activists accused the FCC of venting the attack, which apparently came just after a wave of net neutrality supporters tried to submit comments after the comedian John Oliver tackled the issue in his HBO show. There are now more than 2.9 million comments on the FCC's net neutrality proposal, though many come from spam bots repeating the same comment over and over again. Last week, people would say their names and addresses were attached to anti-net neutrality comments without their permission and asked the FCC to notify other victims of the impersonation and remove fraudulent comments from the net neutrality docket. Today, a conservative watch group called the National League and Policy Center accused pro-net neutrality groups of spanning the comment system. The FCC is accepting comments on its plan until August 16th. 
uh, Wyden and Schultz previously asked the FCC chairman, um, Ejit Pai, for more detailed information on the DOS attack, and they requested a response by June 8th. Today's letter to the FBI asked for an update on the status of the FBI investigation by June 23rd, and the FCC has said it spoke with the law enforcement about the attack, but no details of the ongoing investigation have been revealed. When contacted by ARS today, an FBI spokesperson said we received the letter and provide a response to the members of Congress. So I will follow up with this, um, both here and on the metaverse, as soon as this plays out. Probably most likely won't be any type of results until the beginning of July. Uh, Chinese Bitcoin exchanges resume, resume withdrawals. A lot has been going on with the uh, exchanges in general, with some of them have because the, due to the, the price of Bitcoin, which at one point peaked at 3000 per Bitcoin, that a lot of them were either getting um, DOS attacked or weren't um, capable of processing the orders. And now that the fact that the Chinese uh, exchanges are now allowing withdrawals, but in a limited fashion, uh, I think this is very good in some sense. But, you know... Uh, I'm not going to read the entire article. I'm just going to read some of it. It's it begs the question about really the the centralization or the certain avenues that have been centralized for people to obtain Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency actually. So here we go. Chinese Bitcoin exchanges with room withdrawals by Kevin Helms. This comes from Bitcoin.com. Uh, Bitcoin withdrawals resume following inspection by the People's Bank of China, the PTC, Hubei. An OK coin halted coin withdrawals in February, almost four months later, on Wednesday, May 31st. At least two of them reportedly lifted the cryptocurrency withdrawal suspensions. And according to twi Twitter user CN Ledger, BTC customer service confirmed that they have resumed coin withdrawals on Wednesday. A Reddit user who claimed to have initiated withdrawal requests at the exchange said the daily limit was 20 BTC for his account type, and then he had his request approved within 20 minutes. OK coin has lifted the withdrawal suspension. Uh, subject to certain limits, APTC reported on two Thursday that the 24-hour withdrawal limit of the international site in OKX is 200 BTC, 500 LTC, and 1,000 ETH. So, 200 Bitcoins, 500 Litecoins, 1,000 Ether. The publication quoted the exchange website as for the Chinese site, the limit is 20 Bitcoin, 10 of which would be wrong, withdrawn to external address, 400 for Litecoin, 200 which can be withdrawn to external address and 1,000 Ether. However, the exchange customer service told the publication that the withdrawal feature is being tested at the moment. The last of the big three Chinese exchanges resumed withdrawals is Huba. According to CN Ledger, on Thursday morning, Huba has resumed withdrawals and users can withdraw up to uh, 50 uh, Bitcoin per day. So, I'm not saying, thinking that there's going to be a mass ex exodus off of these exchanges, but I think a lot of people are going to... Uh, limit their exposure, if you will, and, and lessen the amount of coins they keep on the exchange, which is a good thing. You, you If you don't control your private keys, then you don't control the coin. Uh, this comes from Quartz. It's a little bit of a follow-up to my um, review, if you will, on Herosia's Thought Bubble on the 21 Co. company. <clears throat> For $600 in Bitcoin, you can spam all the partners at Andreessen Horse. So Andreessen Horse is a very big time cap, uh, venture capitalist. He's responsible for a lot of different tech companies getting their initial capital. He's made money, they've made money. And he's kind of a bit of a guru, if you will, in the Silicon Valley. So here we go. It's written by Jean In Wong. It's a perfect storm of Silicon Valley buzzwords. Get your hustle on by pitching Andreessen Hortz, big name partners using Bitcoin, and create the future of money while you're at it. That's the offer from the Bitcoin Startup 21, founded by Andreessen Hortz partner uh, Baji Sirnavasan. Uh, Sirnavasan, at one time, tip to lead the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, wrote about the rationale for companies' 21 lists feature on Medium. Almost every business eventually involves building lists of prospects and then contacting them, he wrote. Uh, enterprise sales, recruiting, and fundraising are three activities in particular that fit this description. Corporations spend huge amounts of time and money in this broad area, but the whole process is slightly, uh, highly uh, inefficient. So 21 Company is, um, just kind of a bit of a review, is a company that allows you to create a public identity and you can put your email address attached to it and then what someone does is they, they write a question and you set the amount, whether it be $1, $10, or $100. Uh, 
you can send that question to, uh, for example, I have uh, my profile, Huru Hushai, and for $1, I would answer your question. Now, if I don't answer your question, you don't pay out. But the moment I receive, you know, I receive it and begin the answer in, then you pay out the, you know, $1, $10, $100. $10. And so they've listed, you know, there's a bunch of people listed there, and there's just different companies listed there. So you can contact um, people, uh, big, big-time big gurus and VCs, and pay them this amount of money in Bitcoin, and you can ask them a question or a series of questions, if you will. And this kind of pay-for-email type of feature allows for people to get, you know, value for their time, if you will. It also kind of cuts down spam. Here's a selection of 21 prices per list. Um, Andrew Houston Sports Partners is $600 for 32 partners and top executives like his head of marketing. Uh, CEOs is $1,000 for 77 CEOs, mainly at biotech, Bitcoin, and blockchain companies. And VCs, $1,100 for 39 VCs, including the man of the moment, Jeremy Liu, who invested in Snapchat early. So users can email everyone on the list for one price, and they'll only pay if they get a response. Those receiving the money can choose to keep their Bitcoins or automatically donate to one of the three charities. Uh, 21's pay for email features the Bitcoin version of LinkedIn's in-mail, which lets users of the social network pay to contact strangers. LinkedIn doesn't report how much it makes from in-mail, but users have to pay for a premium account in order to send one. Uh, LinkedIn reported a $532 million in revenue from premium, premium subscriptions in 2015. 21's current focus on paid emails is a significant departure from its original somewhat fantastical version of an embedded Bitcoin mining chip. In everyday electronic appliances, if 21's change of strategy is any indication in the future of finance looks to look a lot like the corporate hobnobbing of the present. And again, um, in my review, we kind of cover all the different aspects of 21 as a company. And then lastly, this comes from Coindesk. A U.S. congressional group calls on IRS to clarify Bitcoin tax guidance. Um, there was a series of congressional hearings that were held on June 9th. And um, there was a discussion of cryptocurrencies, digital assets, and blockchain, if you will. So a bunch of those videos are up on YouTube. I'm sure the think pieces and articles will start coming out um, either Monday or Tuesday as people have an opportunity to um, watch these hearings and go through it and talk to the parties that were involved. But here we go. Uh, the leaders of the U.S. Congress caucus focused on blockchain are calling for more guidance from the Internal Revenue Service regarding to the tax requirements for digital currencies like Bitcoin. In a letter dated June 2nd and penned by Representatives Jared Pulse and David uh, Schwarzkirt, co-chairmen of the Blockchain Caucus, the congressional group, which was founded last autumn, the two called on the tax agency to issue additional guidance on the tax consequences and basic tax reporting requirements for transactions using virtual currency. The letter evokes recommendations issued last November by the Tre Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, which criticized the IRS for its lack of comprehensive strategy around digital currencies. At the time, TIG TA said that the agency's shortcomings were leaving investors in the dark and increasing the risk of possible tax avoidance. Uh, Polis and Schurz encouraged the IRS to consider the recommendation of the TIG TA and take action based on their recommendations. Notably, they urged the IRS to work with digital currency space directly as it moves forward. The co-chairs wrote that further we encourage the IRS to engage with virtual currency exchanges to better understand the ability to engage in information reporting, including record-keeping to track realized gain or losses and the identity of the amounts of virtual currency used in taxable transactions. This is the second letter sent to the IRS from Congress in recent days on the subject of digital currencies. Late last month, a group including Senator Orrin Hatch requested a response from the agency about its investigation to the digital currency exchange Coinbase. The response is due today, though whether it's been formally delivered to Congress has not been announced. So we'll eventually follow up about this because it's important to understand, you know, the, the tax issue and then the potential liability that could uh, be happening for people. Um, already, uh, we talked a little bit and we're going to follow up on about the sellers who uh, local Bitcoin, they're being um, targeted and popped by the IRS and the feds for um, selling digital assets without a money transmitting license. And it's not just the states is happening, it's happening kind of all over, um, globally, if you will. So that's it for the news. On to the discussion about Bitcoin XT. So what is Bitcoin XT? So we're going to read from the Wicca, and then we're going to break things down. Uh, the Bitcoin XT is a fork of the Bitcoin Core, the reference client for the Bitcoin network. 
In mid-2017, the concept achieved significant attention when the Bitcoin community amid a contentious debate among core developers over reducing the blockchain size cap. The current reference information for Bitcoin contains a computational bottleneck. Um, and then it talks about the average daily maximum of 300,000 transactions. It is proposed that the blockchain size increase to 8 megabytes, i.e., and then from onwards to automatically increase exponentially, doubling every two years. The proposal did not gain the necessary support to go into effect on the Bitcoin network by early 2016, uh, the earliest possible switchover date. Its use then has been steady decline from March 2016 onwards, and this is very much true. Um, if you go to Coindance, no classic it shows that there's only 145 bitcoin classic nodes currently at this time um let's see if there are any um miners indicating at this time still here in 2017 for bitcoin classic it doesn't really look like that is the case yeah it doesn't look like there's a case of signaling of by uh bitcoin classic at this time so, Mike Hearn, who is one of the um, initial Bitcoin core developers, uh, he developed, published a Bitcoin improvement proposal, BIP64, calling for the addition of a small peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol extension that performs um, the UTX looks up and given a set of outputs. So it was a way of uh, making the uh, transaction fees a, a little bit better, if you will. And then on December 27, 2014, Hearn revised version of 0 0.10 of the client with the BIP64 changes. It was descended to support queries for a Lighthouse crowding platform project. Um, on June 22, 2015, Gavin Andreessen published BIP101, calling for an increase in the maximum block size. The change would activate a fork allowing 8 megabytes with doubling every two years uh, once 75% of the stretch of 1,000 mine blocks is achieved at the beginning of 2016. The new maximum transactions rate under XD would have been 24 transactions per second. So you have Gavin Andreessen with Bit101, and he would go on to form Bitcoin Classic. On August 6, 2015, uh, Andreessen's Bit101 proposal was merged into the XT code base, and on August 15, 2015, a version 0.11a was released to the public. Uh, Bit101 was reverted, and the 2 megabyte block size bump of Bitcoin Classic was applied instead. So, in it, so instead of having the initial concept of having 8 megabytes, it went down it went down to two megabytes as a way of perhaps to try to achieve some kind of consensus. According to Bitcoin statistic website Coindance, the software peaked at more, one, at more than 1,000 nodes in August 2015 before declining to a second peak in January 2016, around 670 nodes, and we just stated what it is at 2017. Uh, March 2016, the program was seen as consistent decline its user base is less than 30 instances in January 2017. So... With this proposal, there was a couple of different things. One, it was addressing the block size. It was asking to release, you know, and increase it to 8 megabytes. Two, it was changing the consensus rules that were have been established in place with BIP9, where you need to have 90% of, yeah, I believe it's 90%, let me check, miners had consensus to order to change uh, the protocol. And this is where people had some issues with Bitcoin, XT because they believe that the one that the, the block size was getting too large, it was too big, and two that this changed the consensus rule to a lower threshold instead of keep maintaining it at the uh, ninety percent spot. So the, these were the two things against it. The third thing, and I think this changed somewhat, was that the fact that it wasn't coming directly from all the Bitcoin Core developers; it was just coming from a small subset or group. Um, while Mike Hearn was a Bitcoin developer, uh, it wasn't all of them pitching in and, and doing it as one. He kind of went separate and did his own thing. Uh, I wouldn't say called Rogue. I, I would say that he was just pushing out this proposal because Bitcoin is decentralized. So anyone can make any type of proposal or changes. You just have to get consensus. And this is where you start seeing the fray where some people are saying you need to stick with the Bitcoin core developers. Um, they let us thus far, and then others are saying, no, this is a decentralized project. Anyone should make a type of proposal as long as the, the coding is sound, it's been tested, and it gets consensus. So this is when you start seeing really the, the fray uh, within the Bitcoin community. It really started a little bit in the beginning of 2015, as Mike Hearn was talking about this, and then the release, the official release of Bitcoin XT August 15th. 
um, just going a little bit more into the Wicca article here. Uh, the 2015 release of XT, we, we see widespread media coverage. The Guardian wrote that Bitcoin is facing a civil war. Reason wrote that Bix Bitcoin XT represents a technical and a uh, philosophical divergence. Wired wrote that Bitcoin, Bitcoin XT exposes the extremely social, extremely democratic underpinnings of the open source idea, an approach that makes open source so much more powerful than the technology controlled by one person or organization. Uh, developer Adam Back was critical of the 75% activation threshold being too low and that some of the changes were insecure. In the event of an XC hard fork stalled on uh, January 2016, the, the earliest possible date for the transaction to take effect, only approximately 10% of Bitcoin miners were using the XC protocol to sign blocks, where 75% would have been required to make the new protocol the de facto standard. Uh, the software lacked the support of some of the Chinese, Chinese biggest mining pools, and the Bitcoin community a response to the software has been attributed to the the gradual change based on consensus. So a lot of it has to do, really, I think, is with this consensus rule. I think if he, he had stuck with the original consensus rule, maybe we would have big, uh, uh, this change uh, within the Bitcoin core um, core development, but that, that was not the case. And this is the beginning of, like I said, the fray. Right after that, you had Bitcoin Classic, and we'll talk about the different BIPs or are involved here and the difference between BIP 100 and BIP 101. But this is the beginning of the of the schism, if you will, within the community. <coughs> so this is an article from Bitcoin Magazine. It was written by Aaron Van Weerden from August 21st of 2015. So everything you need to know about the proposed changes to the Bitcoin block size cap. Uh, Bitcoin is entered to a new phase of existence. Prominent developers Mike Kern and Gavin Andrews have made changes to the alternative Bitcoin implement implementation of Bitcoin XT designed to fork Bitcoin's blockchain in order to allow for bigger blocks. Uh, Bitcoin and users in particular miners are therefore faced with a choice. Will they support Bitcoin XT and vote for an 8 megabyte block size limit doubling every other year? Or will they stick to Bitcoin Core with 1 megabyte blocks, limiting the Bitcoin network to a maximum of 7 transactions per second? Or at least that is the choice that is often presented. In reality, the possibilities are not binary. At the time of the publication of this article, two other core developers have proposed three more pro bit improvements proposals to increase the block size improvement and even wider spectrum ideas are suggested on the development mailing list forums chat rooms and other media the article uh, presents an undoubtedly incomplete overview of these ideas categorizing six types of solutions solution one no cap on the block size and we'll talk about that um, i'm not going to read it right now um, two a fixed cap on the block size uh, the simplest and current uh, solution to solve the problem is implementation of fixed clock Fixed cap. The block size limit set by the Bitcoin's core development team and embedded in the Bitcoin protocol. This fixed pack cap is currently one megabyte as set by Satoshi Nakamoto, but is slowly coming within reach as the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network continues to increase, which is already is already done. In order to prevent blocks from filling up, several several other limits have been proposed. A last ditch effort before shifting his efforts to Bitcoin XT. Andreessen suggested raising the block size limit to twenty megabytes, although that this was never formalized into a bit. A uh, conglomerate of Chinese mining pools later indicated that a 20 megabyte might be problematic as the Great Firewall of China could limit the propagation of Bitcoin blocks over the network and instead propose a compromise to 8 megabytes. And since consensus was not reached, core developer J Jeff Garzik recently submitted BIP 102 to double the maximized block size to 2 megabytes in order to buy time to come up with better solutions. Naturally, every other size could be picked as possible limit as well, whether it's 4 megabytes or 400 gigabytes, or even decreasing the size as core developer Luke uh, Dash Jr. suggested. A slight variation of this idea is a recent proposed by core developer Sergio Lina and to hold on to the 1 megabyte limit but speed up the block intervals. If 1 megabytes are found every 5 minutes instead of 10, that would allow for doubling the amount of transactions on the network, would also decrease confirmation times. So the, like I said, this really started the different, the genesis of the schism here. Solution three, of growing the cap. And we'll talk about keeping the block size, staying the block size. Of, we're we're going to cover all these different types of proposals. A growing cap. Arguably the best, the biggest problem with a fixed cap, any fixed pack cap, is that it's hard to change. A change of the block size limit requires a hard fork, meaning all users need to make the switch in order to be, not to be left behind on the old blockchain. This is not an easy feat on a decentralized network, especially if different participants in the network vary in their preferences. Furthermore, since the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network is optimistically expected to keep rising, while the cost of bandwidth and hardware is optimistically expected to keep falling, it is broadly assumed that block size should grow over time. 
Uh, this is why Andreessen proposed a growing block size limit based on Moore's Law and Nelson's Law. His first public suggestion was to automatically increase the limit by 50% per year, which he later adjusted to 41% or 100% per two years, combined with an initial bump to 8 megabytes, a number picked in accordance with Chinese mining proposals. So these Chinese miners have, because they have the biggest say in the mining field, if you will, they, they have a lot of sway in the community of what's going to get pushed out there. He formalized his proposal in BIP 101, and since it was not adopted by the Bitcoin Core development team, Anderson had programmed BIP 101 into Bitcoin XT to be triggered at once 75% of the hashing power as expressed supported. Another quarter developer, Peter Will, thinks Anderson's preferred growth rate is much too progressive, and based on research by the Blockstream Kong League, Russ, uh, Russell, Russell Will believes averages, average internet connection speeds will not be able to keep up with Anderson's proposal. Uh, Willis therefore proposed to increase the block size limit by 17% per year starting 2017 with his formalized BIP 103. Um, and like I said, well, I'm going to read these BIPs and kind of break a little bit of them down. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about Moore's Law and Nelson's Law here, because this is something often talked about. So Moore's Law is the observation of the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. This observation is named after Gordon Moore, the, count, the co-founder of the Fairchild uh, sem Semiconductor in Intel, whose 1965 paper described a doubling every year in the number of components per integrated circuit. So basically, technology is going to double every couple of years. As soon as something comes out, you know, your competitor or yourself is, you're going to improve upon it and double and double and double. And kind of reading more from the wicker here, the period is often coded as 18 months because the Intel executive, Dave House, who predicted the chip performance would double every 18 months. Moore's prediction proved accurate for several decades and has been used in the semiconductor industry to guide long-term planning and to set targets for research and development. Advancements in digital electronics are strongly linked to Moore's law, quality adjusted microprocessor micropro processing, memory capacity sensors, and even the number of size of pixels in digital cameras. Uh, digital electronics has contributed to the world's economic growth in the late 20th century and early 21st century. Moral laws describe a driving force of technology and social change, productivity, and economic growth. So because of this law, this understanding of how electronics is going to happen, you were able to project out and, and figure out how to build and, and to um, advance your products and to your programming, just everything. It was just a nice little roadmap, if you will. So I'm just going to finish a little bit here, and then I'm going to talk about um, the Nelson's Law. So because, you know, why this is important is because, you know, as everything is doubling, then people are going to have the access to be able to process in the increased size of the blocks. They'll, they'll have the hardware to do that. So it's important to understand that the technology is going to advance farther than further, if you will, than say where the software program is currently at this time. Uh, Intel stated in 2015, the pace of advancement is slow starting at the 220 NM feature with around 2012 and continuing to 14 NM. Uh, Brian Krause, the CEO of Intel, announced that our cadence today is closer to two and a half years than two. This is his schedule hold through uh, 10 M with a late 2017. He cited the Moore's 1975 uh, revision as a precedent for the current deceleration, which results from technology challenges as a natural part of history and Moore's law. However, in 2016, uh, Intel CEO Brian Kurtz stated that in my 34 years in the semiconductor industry, I witnessed advertising, advertised death of Moore's Law no less than four times. As we progress from 14 nanometer technology to 10, to 10 nanometers and plan for a 7 meter and 5 nanometer and even beyond, beyond our plans as proof that Moore's Law, law is alive and well. In January 2017, he declared, I've heard the death of Moore's Law more, than, more times than anything else in my career. And I'm here to tell you today to, to really show you and tell you the more law is alive and well and flourishing. Uh, today's hardware is designed in a multi-core manner to keep up with Moore's law. In turn, it also means that software has to be written in a multi-thread manner and to take full advantage of the hardware. So if you know or you can project out what the next upcoming hardware is going to be like, you can adjust and handle your um, software accordingly, if you will. So you, you kind of need to update. That's why you have all these updates and software updates and things get faster, clearer, brighter, uh, stronger. There's more things you can do. And this all has to do with the concept of Moore's Law. 
So uh, Nelson founded the discount usability engineering movement for fast and cheap improvements of user interface and invented several usability methods, including heuristic evaluation. He holds 79 United States patents and mainly on the ways of making the web easier to use. So Nelson gave his name to Nelson's Law, which stated that the network connection speed for high-end home users would increase 50% per year or double every 21 months. As he correlated, he noted that since the growth rate is slower than that predicted by Moore's Law of processing power, user experience remain uh, bound with bound. Uh, Nelson also defined the five quality components of usability goals, which are learnability, uh, efficiency, um, memorability, errors, as in low error rate, and satisfaction. Uh, Nelson has been criticized by some graphic designers for failing to balance the importance of other user experience considerations, such as a type, uh, typographic readability, visual cues for uh, hierarchy and importance in eye appeal. Uh, Nelson has been quoting that computing in the mainstream press for his criticism of Windows 8 user interface, and Tom Hobbs, creative director of the design firm T, criticized what he perceived to be some of Nelson's points on the matter, and Nelson responded with some clarification. Nelson's tw 2012 guidelines of the websites for mobile devices he be designed separately from their desktop-oriented counterparts has come under fire from WebMonkey as well as Josh Clark writing in net. Uh, so basically, the ability for people to have access to the process and be able to get into, you know, connect, connect should be increasing, you know, 50% double every 21 months. So as broadband is built out, as connections are building out, as mobile devices, the cell towers are getting out there and you, know, you have satellites and you have all these different connection points come up and you start having, you know, both mobile devices and web pages looking more, Cleaner, effective, efficient, people are able to access, understand, able to click, point, and do whatever they need to do. Connect with ease. There's no glitches. There's no errors. There's no, uh, when you're loading up, you know, a YouTube video, you're not getting a little, little circle, 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 circle thing. Uh, so you're able to process everything, and it has less to do with the hardware and more to do with your, your connection speed. And as that is improving, then you should be able to connect to the, the Bitcoin network um, have the appropriate hardware and be able to contribute to this peer-to-peer -peer system. So as these things are occurring, um, some people are saying that this hold on the one megabyte load is bullshit and that the raising of the eight, eight megabytes or two megabytes or four megabytes um, that people are not going to be able to participate is a bit bullshit. Now, when you're talking about basically, you know, the first world, the westernized world, if you will, to some extent, that's very true, that it's, that is bullshit. But when you start getting down into the second world and the third world, some of these countries don't have the access, the ability quite as easily. They're still on mobile. They don't, they're not necessarily going to have desktops. They're not going to have as many cloud servers or network connections or broadband lines on the ground. They're going to be highly dependent on mobile. And this is where you're going to start having issues with them with increased um, block size where you're not going to have as distributive a network as you would like with something like Bitcoin when you start getting into the second and third world countries. Not that they can't participate, it's just their speed and their connection is not as sound or as strong. And there's some truth to that. But it gets kind of muddy when you, we get this back and forth stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about the negatives when we go through all the different... Um, proposals uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons when you get to that um, but mostly I just want to cover exactly what Bitcoin XT is and, and all the other proposals that are being made to this whole block size debate so continuing on down um, solution four, a dynamic cap uh, this is something that Bitcoin Unlimited is somewhat doing regardless of preferred figures the set growth of rate has its own problems most importantly is typically including predictions about the future and no one can reliably predict the future. The growth of Bitcoin usage has proved to be rather unpredictable over the past years. In historic technological improvement rates defined by Moore's laws or Nelson laws, and in reality not laws at all, rather trends. This is why some suggest that Bitcoin might need a dynamic cap instead of a fixed cap or a cap based on set growth rate. A dynamic block size limit would, much like a mining difficulty, readjust itself automatically based on a predefined rule set. And again, this has been multiple ideas on how to define the rule set. Another of Andrew's suggestions is readjusting the block size limit on the basis of the size of the recent block. Then it itself can be done in multiple ways, and Andrews agreed to take the average size of the last 144 blocks about a day's worth 
and double it to represent the new limit. If the block of the past day was an average 1 megabyte in size, the limit will automatically be set on 2 megabytes. A similar proposal entitled to adjust the maximum block size once a certain threshold is reached. For instance, when a series of blocks would on average reach 90% capacity, the block size limit would automatically readjust upward. Or if a series of blocks would not reach uh, 50% of the uh, maximum block size, the limit would automatically readjust downward. But it's also proposed to use parameters not even directly related to the block size. The block size limit could, for example, be linked to the total amount of fees in the block, or it could be based on mining difficulty, a proposed by core developer Greg Maxwell, as long as its integral parameter block, Bitcoin's block size limit could be tied to it. So you can just adjust up and down just based on network usage, which would help with the, at the time when this was proposed, it would have helped with uh, the box filling up the block size because there were some blocks that were not getting completely filled and there were others that were that's really not the case right now that everything is getting you know packed in as, as it can <clears throat> solution solution five uh, almost all interesting dynamic cap suggestions however can seem to have one common weakness the data that forms the new dynamic cap on the block size limit can often be manipulated for instance, miners can send transactions to themselves in order to fill up blocks or to increase fees. Therefore, a more transparent solution would be a direct vote, possibly on some kind of regular interval. The solution begs another question, who gets to vote? An obvious option would be to allow all Bitcoin users to vote, but unfortunately it's not really possible to determine who the Bitcoin users are, while it's easy to gain elections by posing as multiple entities. However, it is possible to vote with Bitcoin. This could possibly be done by setting up burn addresses as voting booths. Anyone can partake in the election, though it would cost money to do so, as the Bitcoin used to vote would be lost forever. This way, the side of the debate that is prepared to send most Bitcoin on the desired solution wins, and elections would literally and intentionally be up for sale. It's also possible to organize a one Bitcoin, one vote election without the need to burn Bitcoin, as endorsed by core developer Peter Todd. Bitcoin holders can vote on the block size with the Bitcoin they control, meaning the biggest stakeholders in the Bitcoin economy would have most of the influence on the block size limit. So this is what kind of really is happening right now. This point is people are picking sides when it comes to the different proposals, whether it be Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin Core, SegWit 2, SegWit 1, you know, user-activated user activated software. They're choosing by where they're keeping their Bitcoin, what wallets they're using, which nodes they're running, and, and which exchanges they're participating in. So there's that dynamic that is happening right now. Uh, within the community. And lastly, of course, there's a voting method that is already used to determine consensus within the Bitcoin network, hashing power. Hashing power currently gets to determine what the longest chain is, and also could be used to vote on the block size limit. The idea was formalized by core developer Jeff Karzik and BIP100. BIP100 transfers the power to set the block size limit from the core development team to the Bitcoin min miners by allowing miners to include a message into a freshly mined blocks indicating they want to mine bigger or smaller blocks. If 90% of the hashing power endorses either bigger or smaller blocks, the block size limit will double or half every nine days in 90 days. As a possible downside of BIP100, miners and especially larger large mining pools would of course again gain even more power of the network than what they, they have today. But at least it would be transparent. Extension blocks. Uh, again, this is another aspect of um, some of the proposals out there, one of them being Bitcoin Unlimited. A lot of them have like different BIPs all baked into them, if you will. A completely different solution is conceived by Hashcash inventor and blockchain CEO Adam Back, and that is perhaps the most advanced idea to date. Back proposed, proposed allowing so called extension blocks on the Bitcoin network. In essence, extension blocks would be an opt in solution. The one megabyte limit could be remain intact with, while users and miners would be willing to handle bigger blocks, say 10 megabytes in size, could run software to process these as well. This would introduce a new dimension to the Bitcoin usage. It would essentially create multiple blockchains with the same Bitcoin. The 1 megabyte blockchain would simply be more secure than the 10 megabyte blockchain. Furthermore, it would still be possible to accept, store, and spend Bitcoin on the 10 megabyte blockchain while running only a full node for the 1 megabyte, megabyte blockchain, or even no full nodes at all. Users could, for instance, run a full node for the 1 megabyte blockchain on which they could store the bulk of their money, while using an SPV wallet for the 10 megabyte blockchain for day-to-day -day payments. Bitcoin would of course be transferable from the 10 megabyte to 1 megabyte blockchain, 
through the decreased security on the 10 megabyte blockchain, we suggest to wait for some extra confirmation before trusting the payment on the one megabyte blockchain. So you and SS would have two blockchains tied together as one. We would be transferring from one to the other um, for the value of wealth. And finally, flexible caps deserve a mention. While not really a complete solution to the block size issue as a whole, some type of limit still needs to be set somehow. Flexible caps could relieve the Bitcoin network from a lot of stress. Separately proposed by mathematician Neen uh, Ros Rosenfeld and core developer Gregory Maxwell, flexible caps don't have a hard limit on the maximum block size, but send pen penalized miners for producing bigger blocks. As such, a sudden influx of new users or surge in transaction volume will not lead to a severe backlog of transactions that would potentially crash the network. Instead, flexible caps will allow room for growth, while at the same time indicating the limit should be adjusted to improve network performance. And just kind of in it here, um, the end of the article, good news and bad news. The good news is the block size issue is being widely discussed by smart people coming up with inventive solutions. A number of new ideas have been proposed, while it's also possible to combine different solutions into new proposals. A dynamic cap, for instance, could easily be combined with a voted cap, or a flex cap could be attached to a fixed cap, or an extension block joined with a set growth. It's even possible to mix three or more solutions to construct a completely unique approach. And who knows, maybe some genius mathematician or programmer will come up with an entirely novel long-term solution for the block size issue. The bad news, however, is that a long-term solution has probably not yet been conceived. Every single possibility so far seems to effectively kick the can down the road. And all sides of the debate acknowledge that Bitcoin will ultimately need additional scaling solutions built on top of the protocol layer, and possibly a revision of the, found, of the funding structure to reward miners. Bitcoin is still an experiment and work in progress with no clear, no clear cut solutions. In an often heated debate, this is the one thing particularly everyone agrees upon. So, here is this is from our Bitcoin, and it's by user Renee Forger. And this is the summary of BIP 100, 101, and 102 proposal. And these are kind of the key proposals that are part of Classic and um, Bitcoin XT. So, here we go. BIP 100. Jeff Garcic proposed to remove the one megabyte limit and let miners decide on future block size. The fork would occur on January 2016, followed by block size upgrades every three months. Because the voting system might be easily rigged for large polls decide to play dirty, the consensus must reach 90% instead of the usual 51% majority. Here's a short summary of the proposal. 1. A hard fork. 2. 2. Removes the static one, me one megabyte block size limit. 3. Simultaneously add a new floating block size limit set to 1 megabyte. 4. The historical 32 megabyte limit remains. 5. Schedule the hard fork on a testnet for September 1st, 2015. 6. Schedule the hard fork on Bitcoin main chain for January 11th, 2016. Changing the 1 megabyte limit is accomplished in a manner similar to BIP34, a one-way locking upgrade with a 12,000 blocks or 3-month threshold by 90% of the blocks. Limit increase or decrease may not exceed two, two times in one any step, and miners vote by in, encoding B, BV plus block size request value into the Coinbase script to vote for 8 megabytes. Votes are evaluated by dropping bottom 20% and top 20% in the most common floor minimum is chosen. That is basically what BIP100 was. You had a 90% threshold for the change in the block size, and you were giving the power more so to the miners instead of the overall everybody in the network. Uh, BIP100. Uh, Gavin and Adrian pro proposed to increase the block size to 8 megabytes starting January 2016 and gradually increase over time at intervals of two years, doubling each time. So again, kind of break down here. So one is 8 my megabyte cap, two doubling every two years, three for 20 years, so in, 20, so in 16 megabytes to 2018, earliest possible chain fork within January 2016, and after a minor supermajority code in the next batch, six and grace period once minor supermajority achieved, code in the next batch. And then Jeff Garzik uh, did, did another proposal with the 102. This is an alternative to BIT 100 from Jeff Garzik as a fallback if other consensus about BIT 100 and BIT 101 is not reached. It allows for a limited experimentation to explore a size increase without going overboard but it's not flexible, probably requires another hard fork, and it's still an arbitrary economic policy not informed by the market, so it's inferior to BIP 100. However, having a minimum minimum agreed backup plan is better than no plan at all, wrote Jeff Garzik. So his change is a little bit different. And then you have um, BIP 103, which is a consensus hard fork by Peter Will. 
Uh, so the abstract here is that BIT proposes a block size growth intended to accommodate for hardware and other technology improvements for the foreseeable future. Motivation. Many people wanted to see Bitcoin scale over time, allowing an increase in number of transactions on the blockchain. It would come at an increased cost for the ecosystem, bandwidth, processing, and storage for relay nodes, as well as the impact on propagation speed of blocks on the network. But technology also improves over time. When all technology depends on have have improved as well as their availability on the market, there's no reason why Bitcoin's fundamental transaction rate cannot improve proportionally. Currently, there's a consensus rule in place that limits the size of blocks to um, one megabyte. Changing this requires a hard fork change, one that will require every full node in the network to implement the new rules. The new chain created by those changed nodes will reject by old nodes, so this would effectively request the, request the ecosystem to migrate to a new and incompatible network. Doing this whole uh, controversy exists a dangerous to the network and the ecosystem. Furthermore, the effective space available is always constrained by the hashing rate majority and its ability to process transaction. No hard fork change that relaxes the block size limit can be guaranteed to pro provide enough space for every possible demand or even particular demand unless strong centralization, centralization in the mining ecosystem is expected. Because of that, the development of a fee market and the evolution towards an ecosystem is able to cope with block space competition would be considered healthy. This does not mean the block size or its limitation needs to be constant forever. However, the purpose of such a change would be evolution with technology growth and not kick the can down the road because of fear of change in economics. Bitcoin's advantage of, over other systems does not lie in scalability. Well-designed centralized systems can truly compete with Bitcoin's on-chain transactions in terms of cost, speed, and reliability, convenience, and scale. It is power lies in transparency, lack of need for trust in network peers, miners, and those who influence and control the system. Wanting to increase the scale of the system is in conflict with all those. Attempting to buy time with fast increase is not wanting to face the reality and treating the system as something whose scale trumps all other concerns. The long-term scalability plan should aim on increasing the need for trust required in off-chain systems rather than increasing the need of trust in Bitcoin. In summary, hard forks are extremely powerful, and we need to use them very responsibly as, as a community. They have the ability to fundamentally change the technology of economics of the system and can be used to disadvantage those who expect these certain rules to be immutable. They should be restricted to un un to uncontroversial changes or risk eroding the expectation of low trust needed in the system in the long term. As the block size debate has been controversial so far, for good or bad reasons, the BIP amidst of the gradual change and effects start from far enough in the future. So specification. The block size limitation is placed by a function below, applied to the medium this time set of previous 11 blocks. Implement a series of block steps on one every 97 days between January 2017 and July 2063. Uh, each increase the maximum size block size by 4.4%, and this allows an overall growth of 17.7% per year. So just a very slow, gradual increase of the block size. Rationale. Waiting 1.5 years before the hard fork takes place should provide ample time to minimize the risk of a hard fork if found uncontroversial, because every increase, including the first, if only 4.4% risk from a large market or technological changes, is minimized. The growth rate of 17.7% growth per year is consistent with the average growth rate of bandwidth in the last years, which seems to be the bottleneck. If over time there, this growth factor is beyond what the actual technology offers, the intention should be a soft fork or a tighter limit. Using a time-based check is very simple to implement, needs little contents, inefficient, and trivial renewable. Using the medium time pass guarantees uh, mononite behavior as the medium is required to increase and according to Bitcoin's existing consistent, consistent rules. So using a, a, a soft fork and, um, as a means of a check and balance, if you will. Uh, using the medium time pass of a block before means we know in advance what the limit of each block will be without depending on the actual block timestamp. So making the computations a little bit much easier and you don't have to do all this extra work, if you will, um, when it comes to propagating blocks on the network. Um, compatibility. This is a hard fork change that break, breaks compatibility with old, old fully validated node. It should not be deployed without widespread consensus. So you have these proposals going on, and I'm going to read a little bit more about Bitcoin XT because it obviously it failed. It never got activation it wasn't really put on the test uh, test net or really had the, the traction it needed. And a lot of it, I think, again, was the nature of the initial proposal of 8 megabytes. Uh, people thought maybe perhaps it was too large. And the change in the consensus world to downgrade down to 75% 
making um, people felt that it would not allow for a secure network. At the same time, there's also the the position that it didn't directly come from the Bitcoin core developers themselves. And that is, again, a debate within the community. Why should we rely so heavily on a small set subset of people for something that's supposed to be uh, open source and decentralized? You should be having as many different developers or proposals as you like, as long as the consensus is reached. And we'll talk about what consensus is um, as far as Bitcoin goes on the next episode. But uh, continuing a little bit further, and then I want to read, um, because there was an update to the Bit100 when it t- comes to miners. Because again, miners are the hashing, hashing power. We discussed what miners' roles are here. And you need miners when it comes to uh, upgrading and, and doing these type of solutions to the Bitcoin network. And it, what's happening is you're having a lot of these stallouts, and you're having these different proposals and compromises and many people feel well yes miners secure the network they have maybe a little too much say because of the centralized mining that has happened and we'll talk about the nodes and uh, mining hardware a little bit more down the road um, as we continue on our discussion of block size debate how that factors in here because as these proposals are being discussed they do just about you know hardware software um, network connections people having been able to participate in the network and how can they participate if they're downloading too much information at one time and they don't have the bandwidth to participate or they don't have necessarily the the appropriate hardware to do something as simple as having a wallet or running a full node because running a node helps secure the block the the block network as well because it's where the, the transactions are validated is where the transactions of the public ledger and transparency that is needed to continue um, Bitcoin as a currency, as a, um, a platform, if you will, to happen, you, you do need nodes out there in existence. And if you don't have enough node operators, if it's not um, enough of them propagated out into the network, there's not um, decentralized in the sense that they're not consolidating, just like mining is, where you're going to have a consolidated node, then you're going to have some tricky stuff going on where nodes can do stuff like not accept your transaction because it comes from a bad place, which is something miners can do because maybe you bought drugs or something or porn or something like that. Um, these are the type of issues that can happen when you don't have a fully decentralized system. So this comes from January 11, 2016. Scalability debate continues at Bitcoin XT proposal stalls. Coin, this is from Coindesk. So this... You know, after being put out there, people started initially being part, participating part of it, and it just didn't quite happen. So, should a certain controversial alternative to the mainstream implementation of Bitcoin's code have gained traction, today might have marked a significant date in the Bitcoin calendar. However, that was not to be. As many industry observers know, the open source Bitcoin community remains engaged in months-long struggle to determine how best to increase the capacity of the transaction, transaction network. And as of January 11th, that discussion is still ongoing. Ongoing. Initially, the date set by the project developer Gavin Andreessen and Mike Kern, January 11th was to be the earliest possible time that Bitcoin XT would have been introducing larger 8 megabyte blocks to Bitcoin users running the XT software. Others running Bitcoin Core will be still still process 1 megabytes in development, observers argue, amount to the split of the network. Regardless of the proposal, this is consistent in the Bitcoin community that a change is necessary because of the perceived risk to Bitcoin as a payment system should daily transactions increase towards the network's one megabyte limit. At this point, users should be would be forced to, to more actively choose the fee that they would pay to process the transaction in the blockchain, as, essentially making more prominent the postage stamp char- charge that comes with every message. Uh, currently, right now, I believe the average transaction is $5 if you want to get processed um, on the network. The current size of one megabyte means that in the near future, it's possible that the network could effectively become clogged, uh, leaving transactions delayed or even failing altogether, which is happening. Such instances have already happened and highlighted by spammers who have the best push the network to capacity. If a sufficient number of the Bitcoin node offer owners had chosen to adopt XT, uh, 75% to be precise, Bitcoin Improvement Protocol 101 would have been active and the block size of those running that software would have begun to climb. 
It would have seen a block size jump for the present one megabyte up to eight uh, eight megabytes and the doubling every two years into a block size of eight gigabytes was reached. But that hasn't happened. Just ten percent or so of worldwide nodes have converted to XT. And despite support from notable companies like Coinbase, BitPay, Circle, and Blockchain, Bitcoin miners have largely not come on board. Uh, when asked what the lack of consistency on the XT release means for Bitcoin, Hearn, who is now in a minimal involvement with XT, told the CoinDesk in an email that he still believes capacity to be a problem on the Bitcoin network. In particular, he cites the fact that Bitcoin miners have demonstrated willingness to align with decisions made by Bitcoin's core developers, open source meritocracy that oversees code changes. Bitcoin can't be a credible describe any longer a decentralized system in how, it ha- in how it operates and how much influence users and merchants have. Is indistinguishable from any other uh, proprietary payment network. Hearn is now working with a blockchain startup R3, which is working to adapt technology for use by um, enterprise financial institutions. Too much too soon. Of course, if 75% of the nodes switch to XT at this sense, and sometime in the future, uh, BIP 101 would, would still effectively kick in, but that eventually is not looking likely going to be going by bot data and comments from some within the industry. It appears that most miners are in agreement that BIP 101 is too much too fast and tries to predict too far into the future with an appropriate block capital B, said Bitcoin, BitGo engineer James Loop, uh, Jameson Loop. Bitcoin has a strong status quo, co, status quo, and XT has shown just how difficult it is to overcome, which is with all the proposals that are going right now within um, the block size debate. Core developer BTC Dark agreed in his belief that BIP 101 was too aggressive, especially for miners, though this group has earlier stated that they, they, they could handle 8 megabyte blocks. Still, he framed the lack of support as the dominant issue. The XT client was rejected by miners and major businesses because of the lack of support, manpower, and expertise to maintain and help develop their software. In his comments, Anderson, Andreessen told Coindesk that the Bitcoin users should be more proactive about what they want out of the software they run. Statements that Echo has called for a Bitcoin network to support multiple implementations. Uh, the community should tell developers of the software they're using what they want. If the software developers can't or won't give it to them, they should switch software, he said. Notably, Andrew suggests he, he's open to tweaking his proposal or releasing new BIP as necessary. Uh, competing solutions. Despite the different opinions, however, it appears to widely agree that changes to the Bitcoin network's transpar- transaction capacity should take place. Support us to such changes in less, is less of a question of it will happen and more a question of how and when. Other proposals include a method called segregated witness, pro, uh, properly short, shortened to SegWit, first proposed by Bitcoin maintainer and blockchain co-founder Peter Will. This could make transactions appear smaller to current nodes on the network, in theory making a 1 megabyte block become equivalent to 4, four megabytes, although in practice actually more like a maximum of 2 megabytes. The measure, roughly equivalent to re- to reorganizing the closet as opposed to buying a bigger one has attracted support since uh, debuting at the Scaling Bitcoin Hong Kong last year. Yet another solution, a so-called 248 plan, has drawn interest from supporters like BTC, CCC, a China-based Bitcoin money pool, and exchanges a more modest means to raise the block size limit. However, it remains possible that the both solutions could, could be pursued simultaneously due to the different approaches the proposals take to solving the issue. So again, what you're having is you're having all these different players enacting their say within the network, and it's just a matter of getting consensus, if you will. So this article spoke about how um, there was a possibility of a change in a BIP, and that has happened, and this is um, BIP 100. So this came out, uh, Bitcoin.com. Uh, Bitcoin block size growth plan BIP100 gets an update by Justin Connell. This came out March 17th, 2017. So Bitcoin developers Tom Hard, Harding, um, Dagger Vanderberg Johnson, and Jeff Garcik have updated the code of the BIP100, a dynamic maximized block size by minor vote co-proposal, which had been in the works for nearly two years. The BIP, short for a Bitcoin improvement proposal, could serve as a solution to the ongoing debate on the Bitcoin's block size. So BIP 100 puts miners first. The BIP would theoretically allow miners to vote on what the block size limit should be. Mr. Harden believes that miners are actually more invested in Bitcoin than any other participants in the peer-to-peer network, and thus better equipped to make decisions. Uh, they invest in hardware that cannot be used by anything else, and they are the one group that will always every day be paid in Bitcoin and no other currency, the Bitcoin developer says. 
In the aggregate, miners' stewardship to the protocol secures Bitcoin. This is Satoshi's design and has proven correct beyond expectation. When he first read BIP100, Ms. Harden didn't like it. I believe in June 2015, the miners might manipulate the block size in a way, ways that were not in the best interest of all users, he tells Bitcoin.com. But over the next two, two years, it was we developers who showed ourselves unable to man manage the maximum block size reasonably. The text of the Bitcoin BIP100 puts vivid emphasis on the miners. Miners directly feel the effects, both positive and negative, of any maximum block size change imposed by their peers. Reads the proposal on GitHub. Larger blocks allow more growth in on-chain ecosystem, while smaller blocks reduce resource requirement network-wide. According to the GitHub proposers, miners act as an efficient proxy for the Bitcoin system since they earn Bitcoins when they create blocks. In order to be deployed, Bit100 needs to garner a considerable amount of support from miners. A simple uh, deterministic system is to specify where a 75% mining supermajority may activate a change in the max size block size each 20, um, 2016 blocks, reads the proposal. Each change is limited to 5% increase from the previous block size, higher limit, or decrease at is of a similar magnitude. Among the adopted nodes, there will be no disagreement on the evolution of the max size, um, maximum block size according to the BIP100. The system is compatible with emergent consistency, but whereas under the system a miner may choose to accept any size block, a miner following BIP100 observes a 75% supermajority rule and the 5% change limit rule, the proposal reads. Um, excessive block values signaled by the emergent consensus blocks are considered in the calculation of the BIP100 block size harm limit, and the BIP100 calculated maximum size block size is a signal as an excessive block value for the benefit of all observers. Carrot sticks and speed. So BIP100 has been making has been making for nearly two years. The proposal was first published by Mr. Garzik, who runs the um, the enterprise blockchain firm Block, and enjoys waxing about the intersection of artificial intelligence and Bitcoin. Economic actors that wish to see the speed limit, block size limit at X or Y, thus dictating the, the free market, will lobby the chief scientists and other core developers individually and private and public with carrots and sticks, writes Mr. Garzik in the draft for Bit100. When the Bitcoin market grows 10 times or more, the lobbying will be even more intense, yet there is no single human or comment on the planet able to pick a good speed limit. So he's kind of the, on the whole thing, but it but it is out there. And really, I guess you can say it's just it's taking the um, the initial proposal and just refining it, if you will. And again, it's just it's just adding, putting a stronger emphasis on the miners, which a lot of people again are not too keen on for the simple fact that. Uh, Again, it, it might put one um, aspect of the network having too much say instead of having a balance, if you will, with um, nodes and businesses and users and everybody else having somewhat of a say as well. So besides um, not getting consistency and getting enough back backers for Bitcoin XT, um, there was other issues with it. And again, this comes with the whole kind of schism within the community. Um, the discussion of Bitcoin XT banned from Bitcoin subreddit by Peach um, Mardor. And the move, which has so far received apparently almost universal denouncement, Bitcoin community kingpin um, Michael McCarrick, who exerts significant control over Bitcoin talk and the Bitcoin subreddit, has taken an initiative to ban all discussion of Bitcoin XT or the contentious hard fork of Bitcoin Core. While America and others repeatedly use... Um, Jinjusu lost it logic to justify that Bitcoin XT is a fact, not Bitcoin. The truth of the matter is that the only fundamental difference between my current Bitcoin XT is the maximum size of blocks and the maximum amount of transactions per hour. Um, there is no official announcement of the change in the policy, which apparently implemented yesterday, and today users demand further explanation. So there's been a lot of bans within the R Bitcoin subreddit. Um, this causes the prompting of the existence of RPTC. Um, and other different forms of happening um, throughout the Bitcoin network where you have different spaces having discussions um, about all different subject matters. But because Bitcoin Talk and our Bitcoin were such a strong hub and for the longest time really one of the biggest sources for people to, and even to some extent even today, get their, their information about Bitcoin, especially new users, 
uh, it was just saddening to see all the banding, not only just um, Bitcoin XT, but all the different proposals that don't come from Bitcoin Core. Uh, people got banned, shadow banned. The discussion just gets booted and kicked out. Moderators have left. There was discussion about maybe changing who can moderate our Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, it was just a big old mess. And really, the, this is when you get the discussion of how People consider any proposal that doesn't come from Bitcoin Core to be considered an altcoin and not really Bitcoin at all is different. Especially considering that it's if it's pushing a hard fork and causes a split within the network, then there's going to be two different Bitcoins and only one of them can be the real Bitcoin and the other will be an alternative Bitcoin. And then this goes to the whole... The, <clears throat> there's a position in the, uh, the cryptocurrency space where people don't like altcoins. Uh, they only consider Bitcoin to be the really true cryptocurrency worth their time. That um, all the hashing power, all the money, monetary power, if you will, all the the time and effort for businesses and um, users should be devoted towards this coin and not the others because they either are scams or not worthy of your time or just, I guess, pretenders to the throne. It's, it's kind of a little bit silly, if you will. Um, but yeah, that contributed to the discussion and I think it weighed down, especially as this was getting um, pushed out there in 2015, not to have one of the biggest platforms to discuss and debate and engage about, uh, Bitcoin XT and its proposal uh, may have harmed its, I guess you can say its position or its PR movement, if you will, um, within the community. So... Basically, Mike Hearn has kind of somewhat left um, the community, if you will. I'm not going to read his blog post. I'm just going to end it here. It's off of Medium. Um, I'm just going to read the beginning of it. But this comes January 14th, 2016, when basically Bitcoin XT wasn't going to be activated. And this is what he states. Uh, the resolution of the Bitcoin experiment. I spent more than five years being a Bitcoin developer. The software I've written has been used by millions of users, hundreds of developers, and the talks I've given have led directly to the creation of several startups. i talked about Bitcoin on Sky TV and BCC News. I've been repeatedly cited by the economics as a Bitcoin expert and a prominent developer. I've explained Bitcoin to the SEC, to bankers, and to ordinary people I met, I meet, I, I've met at cafes. From the start, I've always said the same thing. Bitcoin is an experiment, and like all experiments, it can fail. So don't invest what you can't afford to lose. I said this in interviews on the stage of conferences and emails. So have other well-known developer, developers like Gavin Andreessen and Jeff Garson. But so knowing that Bitcoin can fail all along, the, new, the now inescapable conclusion that it has failed still saddens me greatly. The fundamentals are broken, and whatever happens to the price in the short term and the long term trend should probably be downwards. I will no longer be taking part in the Bitcoin development and have sold all my coins. Why has Bitcoin failed? It has failed because the community has failed. What was meant to be a new decentralized form of money that lacks systematic important institutions and too big to fail has become something even worse. A system completely controlled by just a handful of people. Worse still, the network is on the brink of technical collapse. The mechanisms that should have prevented the outcome has broken down. As a result, there's no longer much reason to think Bitcoin can actually be better than the existing financial system. Think about it. If you had never heard about Bitcoin before, would you care about the payment networks that couldn't move your existing money, had widely unpredictable fees that were high and rising fast, allow buyers to take back payments that they made after walking out of shops by simply pressing a button? If you aren't aware of this feature, that's because Bitcoin has only just changed to allow it. And suffering large backlogs and flaky payments which is controlled by China and which is in which the companies and people building in it were an open civil war. Um, it's going to be going to hazard a guess. The answer is no. And then he kind of goes on about uh, the deadlock on the blocks. It gets really, really technical. I'm, I'm not going to get down into it. Nobody knows what's going on. So why is Bitcoin core keeping the limit? Um, people problems. When Satoshi left, he handed over the reins of the program we now call Bitcoin Core to Gavin Andreessen, an early contributor. Gavin is a solid and experienced leader who can see the big picture. He, write, he reliably technical judgment is one of the reasons I had the confidence to quit Google, 
where I spent nearly eight years and work on Bitcoin full time. Only one tiny problem. Satoshi never actually asked Gavin if he wanted the job, and in fact, he didn't. So the first thing Gavin did was grant four other developers access to code as well. These developers were chosen quickly in order to ensure the project could easily continue if anything happened to him. They were essentially whoever was around and making themselves useful at the time. One of them, Gregory Maxwell, has an unusual set of views. He once claimed he had mathematically proven Bitcoin to be impossible. More problematic, he didn't believe in Satoshi's original vision. When the project was first announced, Satoshi was, at, was asked how the blockchain could scale to a large number of payments. Surely the amount of data to download would become overwhelming if the idea took off. This was a popular criticism of Bitcoin in the early days, and Satoshi fully expected to be, to be asked about it. He said, the bandwidth might not be prohibitive, as you think. If the network were to get as big as Visa, it would take several years, and by then, sending the equivalent of two HD movies over the internet would probably not seem like a big deal. In a simple argument, look at what the existing payment networks handle. Look at what it takes for Bitcoin to do the same, and the point out the growth didn't happen overnight. The networks and the computers of the future will be better than today, and indeed, the back of the develop, back of the um, envelope calculation suggests that, as he said to me, it never really hits a scaling ceiling, even when looking at more factors than just bandwidth. Maxwell didn't agree with this line of thinking from an interview in December 2014. The problems with a decentralized as Bitcoin grows are not going to diminish either, according to Maxwell. There's an inherent trade-off between scale and decentralization when you talk about transactions on the network. The problem, he said, is that as Bitcoin transaction volumes increase, large companies will likely be the ones running Bitcoin nodes because of the inherent costs. The idea that Bitcoin is inherently due because more users means less decentralization is a pernicious one. It ignores the fact that despite all the hype, real usage is slow, growing slowly, and technology gets better over time. It is the belief that Gavin and I have spent much time debunking. And it leads to an obvious but crazy conclusion. If decentralization always makes Bitcoin good, and growth threatens decentralization, then Bitcoin should not be allowed to grow. Instead, Maxwell concluded that Bitcoin should become sort of a settlement layer for some vaguely defined yet uncreated non-block-based system. And the death spiral begins. In a company, someone who did not share the goals of the organization would be dealt with a simple way, by firing him. But Bitcoin Core is an open-source project, not a company, and once the five developers with commit access to the code have been chosen, and Gavin had decided he didn't want to be the leader, there was no procedure in place to ever remove one, and there was no interview or screening process to ensure they actually agree with the project goals. As Bitcoin became more popular and the traffic started approaching the one megabyte limit, the topic of raising the block size limit was occasionally brought up between the developers. But it quickly became an emotionally charged subject, and accusations were thrown around, the raising limit was too risky, that was against decentralization, and so on. And like many small group people prefer to avoid conflict, they can was kicked down the road. Complicating things further, Maxwell founded a company that then hired several other developers, and surprisingly, their views then started to change in line with that of their new boss. Coordinating software upgrades takes time, and so in May 2015, Gavin decided the subject must be tackled and once and for all. Also, there were still about eight months remaining. He began writing articles that worked through the arguments against the raising the limit at one at a time. But it quickly became apparent that the Bitcoin Core developers were hopelessly at loggerheads, and Maxwell and the developers he hired refused to complicate an increase in the limit whatsoever. They were, they were barely even willing to talk about the issue. They insisted that, not, that nothing be done without consensus, and the developer who was responsible for making these releases was so afraid of conflict, he decided any controversial topic in which one side would win simply could not be touched at all and refused to get involved. Thus, despite the fact that the exchanges, users, wallet developers, and miners were all expecting to rise and indeed had been building entire businesses around the assumption what happened, three of the five developers refused to touch the limit, deadlock. Meanwhile, the clock was ticking. Um, massive DOS attacks on XT users to tighten the new blockade. Within a few days of launching Bitcoin XT, around 50% of the network, network nodes were running it, and at least one mining pool had started offering BIP 101 vote, voting to miners. That's when the denial of service attacks started. The attacks were so large that they disconnected the entire regions of the internet. I was DOS. It was a massive DOS that took down my entire rural ISP. Everyone in five towns lost their internet service for several hours last summer because of these criminals. It's, def it's definitely discouraging me from hosting nodes. In other cases, entire data centers were disconnected from the internet until the single XT node inside them was stopped, and about a third of the nodes were attacked and removed from the internet in this way. Worse, the mining pools that had been offering BIP 101 was also attacked and forced to stop. The message was clear. Anyone supporting bigger blocks or even allowed other people to vote for them would be assaulted. 
The attackers are still out there, and when Coinbase months after the launch announced that they had finally lost patience with Quora and ran to XT, they too were forced out of offline for a while. So that's that's another big thing, and I think we might have to discuss it eventually because these DOS attacks on the different proposals and people for them is really, really hurting the community. A non roadmap. Uh, Jeff Garcik and Gavin Andreessen, the two of the five Bitcoin commit core committers who supported the block size increase and the two had been around the longest both had a stellar reputation with the community they recently wrote a joint article called bitcoin is being hotwired for settlement jeff and gavin are generally softer in their approach than i am and i'm i am more of a tell it like i see it kind of guy or as gavin delicately put it honest to a fault so the stronger language in the joint letter is unusual they don't pull punches the proposed roadmap currently being discussed in the bitcoin community has some good points and that it does have a plan to accommodate more transactions, but it fails to speak plainly to Bitcoin users and acknowledge key downsides. Uh, core block size did not change. There have been zero compromises on that issue. In an optimal, transparent, open-source environment, a BIP will be produced and that this has not happened. One of the explicit goals of the Scaling Bitcoin Workshop was to funnel the chaotic core block size debate into an orderly decision-making process. This is not occurred. In hindsight, Scaling Bitcoin stalled a block size decision while transaction fee prices and block size pressure continue to increase. Failing to speak plainly as they put it, it would be more and more common an example that the plan that Gavin and Jeff referred to was announced at the Scaling Bitcoin conference, but it doesn't involve making anything more efficient and managing a new 60% capacity increase only through an accounting trick, not counting some of the bits in each transaction. It requires making huge changes to nearly every piece of Bitcoin related software. Instead of doing a simple thing and raising the limit, it chooses to do an incredibly complicated thing that might buy months at most, assuming a huge coordinated effort. Replaced by fee. One problem with using fees to control congestion is that the fee to get to the front of the queue might change after you made a payment. Bitcoin Core had a, has a brilliant solution to this problem, allowing people to mark their payments as changeable after they've been sent up until they appear in the blockchain. They stated The stated intention is to let people adjust the fee paid. But in fact, the change allows people to change the payment to point back to themselves, thus reversing it. And as this stroke, this makes using Bitcoin useless for actually buying things, as you have to wait for buyer's transactions to appear in the blockchain, which for now on can take hours or other minutes due to congestions. Core reason for this is okay. It goes like this. It's no big loss because he hadn't been waiting for block before. They were theoretically at the risk of payment fraud, which means you were using Bitcoin, you weren't using Bitcoin properly. Thus, making the risk 100% certainly doesn't really change anything. In other words, they don't recognize the risk management exists and so proceed to change at zero, at zero cost. The protocol change could be released with the next version of Core 0.12, so will activate when the miners upgrade. It is massively condemned by the entire Bitcoin community, but the remaining Bitcoin Core developers don't care what other people think, so the change will happen. If that didn't convince you, you Bitcoin has serious problems, nothing will. How many people would think Bitcoin are worth hundreds of dollars each when you soon won't be able to use them in actual shops. And then I'm just going to read his conclusion here. Still, so at not yas, despite everything that's happened in the past few weeks, more members of the community have started picking things up from where I've been putting them down. While making their alternative to Core was once seen as re renegade, there are now two more forks vying for attention, Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin Unlimited. So far, they hit the same problems as XT, but it's possible a fresh, fresh set of faces could find a way to make progress. There are many talented and energetic people working in the Bitcoin space. In the past five years, I had the pleasure of getting to know many of them. Their entrepreneurial spirit and alternative perspective on money, economics, and policies were fascinating to experience. And despite how it's all gone down, I don't regret my time with the project. I woke up this morning to find people wishing me well on the Uncensored Forum and asking me to stay, but I'm afraid I've moved on to other things. To those people, I say good luck, stay strong, and I wish you the best. I do want to point out this, um, and we're going to go a little bit on a different episode about this, where he pointed out um, in his discussion here about the Chinese firewall and the Chinese miners. So, why has the capacity limit not been, not, not been raised? Because the blockchain is controlled by Chinese miners, just two of whom control more than 50% of the hash power. A recent conference of over 95% of hashing power is controlled by a handful of guys sitting on a single stage. The miners are not allowing the blockchain to grow. Why are they not allowing it to grow? Several reasons. One is that the developers of the Bitcoin Core software that they run have refused to implement the necessary changes. Another is that miners refuse to switch to any competing product as they perceive doing so 
as disloyalty and they're terrified of doing anything that might make the news as a split and cause investor panic. They've chosen to say to ignore the problem and hope it goes away. And the final reason is the Chinese internet is so broken by the government's firewall that moving data across the border barely works at all. With speeds routinely worse than what a mobile phone provides. Imagine an entire country connected to the rest of the world by cheap hotel Wi-Fi and you've got the picture. Right now, the Chinese miners are able to just about maintain their connection to the global internet and claim that 25 BTC reward that each block, uh, I think is now 12 uh, since they're writing in this article, that each block they create gives them. But if the Bitcoin network got more popular, they fear taking part would get too difficult and they can lose their income stream. This gives them a, per- a perverse financial incentive to actually try and stop Bitcoin becoming popular. Many Bitcoin users and observers have been assuming up until very recently that somehow these problems can all sort themselves out. And of course, the blockchain size limit can, would be raised. After all, why would the Bitcoin community, the community that's championing the blockchain as the future of finance, deliberately kill itself by strangling the chain in its crib? But that's exactly what is happening. So Mike Kern, one of the earliest um, developers of the Bitcoin community, he left. But his, his leaving... Just like his proposal has um, caused people within the community to really double down and focus on trying to get this this solved, trying to get the governance issues solved. And I'm just going to read this last bit of this article from um, News uh, BTC. If not Bitcoin XD, then Bitcoin Classic it is. Some members of the Bitcoin community now look at, at Mike Kern as a villain. His post is to believe to reaction to the failure of the Bitcoin XT, also known as BIP101. But even while ending his ties with Bitcoin, Mike seems to have done it a huge favor. His revelation departure from the digital currency shook the Bitcoin governance and mining communities. There are now talks of a new coin of a new big improvement proposal called Bitcoin Classic, which has garnered a lot of support, which again also didn't come together. Many Bitcoin mining pools, including the Chinese ones like F2 Pool, have expressed their support to hard fork the blockchain and increase the block size to 2 megabytes, known as Bitcoin Classic. Um, Bitcoin Classic has gained 72% of the required 75% consensus in the network, but it still didn't go over. While we don't want to comment on whether Mike Kern left Bitcoin behind for good or bad, his departure is responsible for creating enough momentum in the Bitcoin community to get the ball rolling in the block size debate. So that's basically to sum it up. This is what... Um, you know, Bitcoin XT, one of the first proposals, it came from Mike Kern and Gavin Andreessen, and it was an alternative to the, the stalemate that was happening within the Bitcoin core development to address the block size issue. Uh, they went for an 8 megabyte size, they wanted um, 75% consensus with the miners to activate it, and doubling up uh, every two years afterwards to address the issues of the the block size to get these transactions out to, to allow people to utilize um, Bitcoin more effective and efficiently. Currently, right now at this time, like I stated earlier in the episode, it's five dollars to uh, make a transaction on this network. And at this point, what is the point of using Bitcoin if you can't use it for what it was perceived and conceived to be, which is a a digital payment system, a, a cash system on the internet? The internet of money, as um, Andrew Andrew Andrews is, as Andrews Anilopoulos, um coined. So that is Bitcoin XT. It's a uh, eight megabyte proposal, seventy five percent. It was one of the first uh, serious, real proposals. They developed a code. You can download a node right now if you still want to to uh, increase the block size debate. And it allowed for the Bitcoin Classic coming to the surface. And then you have Bitcoin Unlimited, which we will get into. But um, it just, it didn't reach consensus. It didn't gather enough of momentum. And it it failed, if you will. So that is it for the episode. Um, Next episode, we're going to talk about consensus. What is the Satoshi Nakamoto consensus um, that everyone keeps talking about in these proposals? And then we'll talk about the block size lowering slash same, why some people want that. And then um, after that, we're going to talk about some of the other proposals that people have out there that that are not SegWit or Bitcoin Unlimited. And then we'll we'll get into SegWit. 
So that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.